Channel 2's Late Show, a scattered brain cop becomes a hero when he writes a book about his exploits. Don Adams stars in Confessions of a Top Crime Buster, next. Yes. He's returned the manuscript again. Hmm. A persistent fella, isn't he? This is the 16th time. Is it any good? Well, you told me not to bother to read it, just to return it. Is it any good? I think it's dreamy. Well, can't be any worse than this is. Let me have it. Oh, Elizabeth. If he telephones again, will you ask him where he buys this candy? Yes, Mr. Dunster. The old saying that crime does not pay is based upon historical fact. I can testify to this from my many years of experience as one of the most successful crime busters in our nation. My adventures over the period of my illustrious career invariably brought me into contact with many hardened criminals. To be sure, most of them I have forgotten. One, however, I shall never forget. The infamous Duke Fletcher. In a way, the Duke was my mentor. Through him, I learned much about the inner workings of the criminal mind. It was this knowledge from him that I drew upon to help me solve many of my most challenging cases. This book is respectfully dedicated to Duke Fletcher. Indeed, a criminal amongst criminals. I first met the Duke some years ago. The place, Sunnybrook Penitentiary. We've got a roommate for you, Duke. Male or female? Hey, copper, don't forget to tell the chef I like my steaks rare. Yeah, I'll do just that. Get that stuff out of there. You're upstairs. Forget it. I don't like sleeping that high above the ground. Well, the only other choice you got is sleeping very low under the ground. Hey, uh, give me a hand getting my stuff up there, will you? Now, now you know the rules. 
My rules. Duke Fletcher's rules. Break one and I break you. Look at me. You got me shaking like a leaf. Maybe I'm not making myself clear. One step out of line, you get this. Oh, yeah? You try that and you get this. He struck a guard? He struck a guard. Well, I told him to impress Duke Fletcher with his toughness, but I never suspected he'd go this far. Okay, George, I'll call the warden and tell him to take Crook out of solitary confinement. Well, you'd better do it fast, see, because uh, Fletcher is due to be moved to death row Monday morning. He'll probably try to make the break sometime between now and the end of the week. Yes, I'm aware of that, but you keep your eye on Crook. And the minute he learns anything about Duke Fletcher's escape, you call me. Where did you say you was from, fresh guy? I didn't. You look familiar. Ever been in the Midwest? Once. I did two to five years in Leavenworth for assault. For assault, huh? That's right. Ah, right now, fresh guy, who are you? Leavenworth's a federal pen. They don't put punks in there for assault. Not if you kidnap the guy first and then assault him. That's federal. I'll buy that. Now will you let go? I did let go. Oh. And I'm going to ask you one more time, nice. What's your name? Trevino. Rudy Trevino. Trevino? You any relation to Pete Trevino? He's my brother. Why didn't you tell me he was Pete Trevino's kid brother before? I'm sorry I told you now. I'm sorry, kid, but Pete Trevino's like family to me. Where family's concerned, I get very affectionate. Ah, uh, that's all right, Duke. Pete used to talk about you all the time before they sent him up. For what? Armed robbery, extortion, obscene phone calls. Oh, that boy always had a lot of class. <laughs> what are you in for, kid? Armed robbery, one obscene phone call, and attempted murder. Attempted murder, huh? Yeah, and with a deadly weapon. <laughs> so you're Pete Trevino's kid, brother. <laughs> Oh, you son of a gun. You know you look a little like him? You know how much he used to talk about you? <sighs> Not as much as he used to talk about you, Duke. and not one word from Crook about how Fletcher plans to make his escape. Today is Friday. That means it has to be sometime this weekend. Well, part of our plan worked. <laughs> Fletcher's really taking the Crook. Treats him like a son. So he's bound to take Crook into his confidence sooner or later. But according to Robinson's last report, Fletcher has become so protective over Crook, he doesn't let him out of the sight for more than 10 seconds. So even if Crook does get the information, how is he going to relay it to Robinson? This could be trouble. Think about him, Crook has been a cop for the past 12 years. Five of those years he worked in this department under me. He's been in tough spots before. Look at his record. You're right. That could be trouble. Where you been, kid? I've been casing the joint. It's a piece of cake, Duke. We can bust out of here with no trouble at all. Now, don't be impatient, kid. When the time comes to bust out, I'll tell you. Yeah, I got something I want to show you. What is it? The guys in the machine shop know I'm planning to break, and they made me this little going away gift. You're kidding. Is that class, huh? That's terrific. I'm gonna put it away for now, though, but when we break out of here, I'm gonna use it on the getaway car. Uh, when will that be? Sunday night. Well, they're showing the movie in the recreation hall. We're going out through the ventilator shaft, and I'm taking you with me. Me? When did you include me in? Well, when I break out of here and leave you behind, kid, you're like family to me. Uh, well, thanks a lot, Duke. I appreciate that. It's been a long time since I had any family. I lost my folks in a car crash during Prohibition. 
Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Duke. How did it happen? They were driving one of my beer trucks, and it crashed through a roadblock. Oh, too bad. You must have taken it pretty hard, huh? I did. That's when I gave up bootlegging and turned to a life of crime. You seem to be a nice kid, so I'm going to give you a little education on how to make a dollar the easy way. I'll go stretch my legs again. Now you stretch them enough. Sit down. What's he giving me the peace sign for? What? Oh, charades. Ah, he's trying to get the message to me by charades. Two words. First word. Two syllables. First syllable. Sounds like gun. Sounds like. What do you keep doing that with your ear for? Uh, my ear, yes. Well, there's a fly buzzing around Duke, and uh, it's bothering me. Oh. Sounds like laugh. Fun. Fun. Ah. Uh. Sun. Ah, that's it. First syllable in the first word is sun. Second syllable. Sounds like... Is that fly still bothering you? Uh, that's all right, Duke. I'll get him. I don't even see it. Uh, yes, well, it's more like a gnat than a fly. You can't see it. You just feel it when it gets in your ear. Pray? Ah, day. Sun. Day. Sunday. What time? What time Sunday? Second word. Sounds like... Night! Did I get it? What? The net. If it comes back again, let me know. I don't think it's gonna come back again, Duke. There's nothing left for it to land on. Come on, kid. Time for lunch. So the break is scheduled for Sunday night, huh, George? How's Fletcher planning to do it? Well, he wasn't able to signal me how without blowing his cover. But I'm sure he knows. Where is he now? He just went into the mess hall for lunch. The minute they finish lunch, you signal Crook to proceed with Plan B. Right. He gets sick, we take him out of the cell, and move him to the infirmary. Yes, and tell him to put on a good act. If he eats the food that they serve in this prison, he won't have to act. <laughs> Meatloaf again. That chef cooks like he's trying to poison somebody. Yeah, that's exactly what he's in here for. Uh, pass the ketchup, Duke. Ketchup. Give me ketchup. Fresh bottle. Fresh bottle. trouble opening their ketchup. Come on, let's go. Where? We're gonna make the break now. Now? You said Sunday night during the movie. You promised. Listen, after this, there ain't gonna be no movie Sunday night. We'll be restricted to ourselves. Now, we make the break now or never. Let's get to the ventilator shack. Change his plans? He what? 
Thank you, George. What is it, Captain? Huh. Duke Fletcher just escaped. Today? Oh, but I thought it was the Sunday night. It was, but a riot broke out in the mess hall, and Duke Fletcher seized the opportunity and made his escape now. Where is Sergeant Crook? He went with him. But if Sergeant Crook went with him, then Fletcher must have him at gunpoint. On the contrary, Crook led the break. It's a good thing we stole this cab, Duke. It would have cost us sixty-six eighty-five to get up here. Sixty-six eighty-five? Why those thieves? You wait here. I'll go see if Manny's inside. Manny? Manny, it's me, Duke. Town waiting for the bus from Phoenix. I just picked up the newspaper and read that you busted out. Why the change in plans? I was all set up for Sunday night. Yeah, well, something went wrong. I'll tell you when I see it. What are you doing at the bus depot? Good news. Your boy Pete Trevino got paroled yesterday. His bus is doing in 15 minutes. Pete Trevino paroled? How about that? Oh, say, listen, I got a big surprise for him. I busted his kid brother out with me. Rudy's with you? He's out front in the car. Well, listen, Manny, don't say nothing to Pete. And I won't say nothing to Rudy. I just want to see the expressions on their faces when they meet. Captain Andrews, this just came in on the telephone. I never figured on this. What's that? This just came in from Arizona. Pete Trevino was paroled there yesterday, and the warden has reason to believe he's on his way here to rejoin Duke Fletcher's gang. Captain, if what you say is true, then Lenny's on barred time. Right. We've got to move fast. Higginbottom, I want to stake out at the airport, the railroad station, and the bus depot. If Pete Trevino is going to rejoin Duke Fletcher's gang, he'll lead us right to him. I'll take the bus depot. Why will you take the bus depot? Because that's the way that uh, Pete Trevino is coming from Arizona, by bus. Why do you figure that? He's a parolee. They always give a parolee a new suit of clothes and ten bucks. The only way you can get here from Arizona for ten bucks is by bus. <laughs> Manny, it's nice to see you. Hey, I read in the papers where the Duke is out, too. Yeah, he couldn't wait for parole. <laughs> he's up at the cabin, he's expecting you. Captain, I was right. Pete Trevino just got off the bus from Arizona and was picked up by one of Fletcher's men. Follow him, George, and radio in as soon as you know the location. Roger and out. but you're pretty good. Yeah, I'm a perfect Manny. Say, kid, I didn't tell you before, but I'll tell you now. You're pretty handy behind the wheel. That was some driving. Oh, thanks, Duke. When'd you ever learn to drive like that? Well, when I did a stretch at Folsom, I took the driver's training course. Huh? Uh, it was part of the rehabilitation program. Oh. a surprise. Look who's here! That's the trouble with family reunions. Nobody ever knows what to say. Say hello to your brother. 
My brother? Don't you recognize your own brother? Pete hasn't changed that much in six years. Uh, of course. It's just that, well, for a moment there, I didn't know it was him. Hey, how are you, Pete boy? What, are you blind? That's Manny. I know it's Manny. It's just that I haven't seen him for a long time either. Hey, Pete, you old son of a gun. Listen, if they find out I'm not your brother, they'll kill me, so play along. If you won't do it for me, do it for Mom and Pop. Pop. That's not my kid brother. He's not your kid. Grab him. My kid brother's still doing time in Ohio. Now, wait a minute, Duke. Who are you going to believe, me or him? What if I said he wasn't my brother either? This is 8312 reporting. I spotted the cabin. It's uh, sitting at the edge of the woods at uh, Chico Pass. That's two and a half miles southwest of Barrington Road. We read you loud and clear, 8312. All units are proceeding. Right. What do we do with him? Take him in there and finish him off right now. May I? No, not you. You just got parole. Stay clean a few days. You do it. Locked himself in. Well, quick, around the back. Let him have it. Go to the window. Must be a cop. Hey, I recognize that car. He was behind me on the way up here. I could have sworn he turned off. We've got to take him and find out who else besides him knows we're here. Let's go. Hey, what about him? He'll keep. Come on. Must have gone around the back when we come out the front. That means both of them are in the cabin. George, what are you doing here? I followed Trevino from the bus station. Where are they? They're in the other room. There's three of them. I think we can take them by surprise. They know I don't have a gun, but they don't know you're here. Okay. Move the chair away from the door. Quietly. When I give the signal, open it fast. Ready? Go. I forgot to unlock the door. Yeah, I know. How come they didn't hear that? Maybe they left. Open the door, huh? Give me that thing in the back of the car. All right, you guys. We know you're in there. We got the place surrounded. You don't stand a chance. Now throw out your guns. Get out your hands raised. George, aren't we supposed to be doing that? You got exactly ten seconds. Hey, look! Let's make a run for the cabin. What are you doing? Well, there's no sign of breaking two windows. Use that one. Sorry, Duke. That's okay. I had it coming. This is what I get for being a fine human being. A fine human being? I gave you the benefit of all my vast knowledge about my business. When I broke out, I took you with me. I taught you all my trade secrets, put clothes on your back and food in your mouth. I bestowed all my tender love and devotion upon you. You forgot one thing. What? Ten minutes ago, you tried to kill me. Hey, I never said I was perfect. Gentlemen, if you will be seated, Captain Andrews will be right in. Well, 
Well, George, this is the big day. What big day? The day we finally get our commendation. I don't think we get no commendation. What do you mean we're not getting a commendation? How can you say that after all we did? How can we miss? Look, first of all, we served undercover in a federal penitentiary. Our lives were at stake every single minute of the day. Then I found out when Duke Fletcher was going to escape and I broke out with him and went to his hideout. You followed Pete Trevino to the hideout and radioed back the location. Then you came in and saved my life and we ended up capturing the whole Duke Fletcher gang by ourselves. Now, how can we miss? I don't know, but uh, we always seem to manage. Well, we'll see. Good morning, gentlemen. We have something that's just come down from the commissioner's office. Did you hear that, George? Yeah, I heard him. Take him out of the envelope, please. I've been instructed to read this to you. Here it comes, George. Now, the city is very grateful for the job you've done in the Duke Fletcher case. Thank you, Captain. But the state is in an uproar. You, Sergeant Crook, have been cited for starting a riot and leading a prison break. Also for stealing a cab at gunpoint and threatening the life of the cab driver. You then ran a roadblock, <laughs> demolishing two police vehicles, cut across a private property, smashing through a barn, and sideswiping the cow. Pick up on a page number two. Here it is, sir. George, I think you may be right. About what? About our not getting a commendation. You then went 90 miles an hour through a farm field, setting fire to a haystack and completely demolishing a plowed field of kumquats. Upon re-entering the highway, you were responsible for two trailer trucks that jackknifed and overturned. One of them carrying bottled water and the other carrying laundry detergent. A short time after that unforgettable interlude at Sunnybrook, fate crossed my path with Mickey Rossetti, a distant relative of the Duke's by marriage. This encounter proved to be a fascinating one worthy of recounting in some detail. It started at the Zenith National Bank. You know what to do. I'll follow in my car. Right, Frank. Some more mail for you, Mr. Mallory. Better read it now. We are holding your wife. Give the bearer of this note five hundred thousand dollars in unmarked bills. Do not call the police. Do not phone your home. We will receive word later where to find your wife. Oh, I know this isn't a trick. You don't. But your wife's life's at stake. You want to take a chance? No, I can't risk it. $500,000, we don't keep that kind of cash on hand. Then you got a problem. I will have it later. When? Our money is delivered from the main reserve at 3.15 after the bank closes. 8312, 8312, come in, 8312. This is 8312, go ahead. We have a code 940, the Zenith National Bank. Repeat, code 940, Zenith National Bank. We're on the way. A 940? What's a 940? I mean, I've heard of a 941, cat stuck in the tree, asked for the landlady, but what's a 940? A 940 is a bank robbery in progress. Approach quietly, no siren. No lights. Maybe they'd like us to turn the motor off and just coast in. Where's that car hop? We can't wait any longer. We'll give you a call later. Tell you where to drop the money. All right. Call the cops, the FBI. Do anything crazy. Your wife gets it right there in your own. Understand? I understand. It's awfully quiet in there, George. Are you sure we got the right bank? Zenith National. Yeah, it's even spelled right. You go in this way. I'll go around the front and we'll have them covered. Right. Oh, hi. Uh, I 
think you've made a little mistake there, lady. Uh, 15 and 12 are not 26, it's 27. Is there a hold up? Hold up? Don't do that. They're not supposed to know. I'm a police officer. All right, everybody, I'm Detective Robinson. Open it up. Step back, please. Step back, please. Okay, we'll take our arms, Detective. My advice to you, Mr. Mallory, is to go along with their demands. In the meantime, we'll do everything in our power to see that your wife has returned to you on arm. But to wait until 3 o'clock, who knows what they'll do to her by then. Let me think for a moment. But Captain Andrews' suggestion makes a lot of sense, Miss Mallory. While you're waiting, would you like to hear how Crook and Robinson responded to that 940? Not now, Hager, madam. If it's just a matter of the money, I'd be willing to pay the $500,000 right now. Oh, I don't think you'll have to pay the $500,000, Mr. Mallory. You don't? Why not? Because that's just their asking price. They'll probably take less. Cook, will you be quiet? Well, all I'm saying is that if Mr. Mallory negotiates, he can get his wife back cheaper. As it stands now, he's paying retail for her. Mr. Mallory, you get back to the bank, wait for the call. In the meantime, I'll put a plan into operation. All right. I'll leave everything in your hands. Thank you, gentlemen. Oh, what happens now, Captain? All right, Crook, Robinson, get out to the Mallory house, gain access, try to apprehend the suspects before they harm Mrs. Mallory. Now, that's not going to be easy, Captain. The minute they spot us, they're going to... Well, how can they spot you if you wear a disguise? What kind of a disguise? Any kind of a disguise. You're a detective. Use your imagination. You've been on assignments like this before. Now, only once before, Captain. That was when all those muggings took place in the park. We'll use the same disguise you used then. Forget it. George and I aren't going to put on those garter belts again for anybody. Look, I don't care what kind of a disguise you use, just as long as you look like people who have a right to be there. A mailman. A mailman wouldn't attract any attention. That's a very good idea, George. Okay, that settles it. George and I will go to the Mallory Mansion disguised as mailmen. You can't both go there as mailmen. A mailman has his individual route. Well, how about this? George will go disguised as a mailman, delivering a package, and I'll be inside the package. I'll accept that on one condition. Now, what's that? That marked on the box, it says, do not open till Christmas. That's the worst idea I've ever heard in my life! You know, kid, one of the best covers in case on the joint is to make believe you're a gardener. I pretended to be a gardener when I cleaned out a big mansion on Long Island. Well, I have a, another idea, Captain. How about this? How about us going uh, disguised as gardeners? Uh, that's not bad, Captain. Oh, no, that's not too bad. Well, that's it. George and I will go to the Mallory Mansion disguised as two Japanese gardeners. Get out. Sayonara. I'll tell you what. Yeah, well, that's Japanese for... Get out! in the ivy and make your way back towards the back of the house. Right. Yeah, and look at where they turn on those sprinklers. You know, all them gardeners water the place. What are you doing? I'm cutting the ivy. One leaf at a time. Lenny, we're supposed to look like we know what we're doing. You ever see a professional gardener cut one leaf at a time? What do I know about professional gardeners? Maybe we should have been encyclopedia salesmen. Hey, George, I just... Turned on the sprinkler. Now turn it off. That window up there is partially open. Probably leads to a bedroom. Maybe we can get up there by climbing this trellis. You think it'll hold us? Yeah, I think so. Feels good and solid. Let's go.
That's the worst looking wallpaper I ever saw. I'll check in here. Same wallpaper in there. If I were you, I'd sign it, Mrs. Mallory. I can't do it. I just can't. Ransom note. Power play. Believe me, Mrs. Mallory, if you don't sign it, you'll be a very sorry woman. All right. I can assure you, Mrs. Mallory, this is the best offer you can get for this house. Help! Help! Please! Help! Help! Somebody call the police! Well, George, what do we do now? A whole lot of apologizing. That's the best news you could bring me. We have even better news. She may have an offer on your house. As soon as those two real estate salesmen cool off. Then the ransom note, the threats, they, they were all a hoax. That's right. Well, I wasn't taking any chances. I, I had the money right here for them. I... Excuse me, gentlemen. Hello. Mallory? Yes, this is Mr. Mallory. That's the man who brought the note. Play along, see what he says. You ready to do business? I have the money, all of it. Put it in an ordinary paper shopping bag and take it to the main railroad passenger terminal downtown. Put the money in a paper shopping bag, drop in trash can near last ticket window, main railroad passenger terminal. Railroad ter Railroad terminal? He sure picked a nice deserted spot. And Mallory, while I'm picking up the money, there'll be somebody keeping your wife company. Uh, the money isn't there. She gets it. Yes, I understand. Now, hold on. Somebody here wants to talk to you. He's putting someone else on the line. Get all the information you can. Darling, this is Myrna. What? Do what they tell you, please. Hello, hello, hello? No, it's not possible. What's not possible? They... They didn't kidnap my wife. Well, we know that, Mallory. It's even worse than I feared. <laughs> what do you mean? They kidnapped my girlfriend. <laughs> $500,000. That's a lot of money to shell out. That's because he didn't negotiate. It's not too late, Mr. Mallory. If you call him now, I'll bet you can get her back for 400000 The money doesn't matter. I'd never forgive myself if anything happened to Myrna. I love that girl. What about your wife? Well, I love her, too. She's a wonderful person. Everybody loves my wife, even Myrna. How's everything going, gentlemen? Fine, sir. The money's all packed and ready. Good. Let's run down the plan now. Mr. Mallory, you're to take the ransom money to the railroad station, put it in the trash basket just where they want it. All right. Don't talk to anybody, and don't try to remain there to get a look at the pickup man. I understand. While you're dropping off the ransom money, Crook and Robinson will try to spring your lady friend. And once she's safe, we'll go after the suspects and the ransom money. Don't let them hurt Myrna. We'll do our best. Crook, show Mr. Mallory out. Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, Captain, I'd appreciate it if we could keep it quiet about Myrna. I mean, a man in my position. You understand? Yes, I understand, Mr. Mallory. And you can expect the utmost cooperation from the men in my department. Thank you. Now, Mr. Mallory, you can depend upon George and I. No one will ever find out you have a mistress. Cook! Do you realize what you just said? Did I have everybody's attention for a minute, please? What I just said about Mr. Mallory having a mistress. Mom's the word. Sir, I checked with the phone company, and they will cooperate. Good. That means the telephone of the girlfriend's house will be put out of order. How soon will I be here? In about 15 minutes. All right. That's how you men can gain access into the house. Understood? Understood. Yes, sir. Now, remember, the men are armed and dangerous, so both of you be very careful. 
Uh, we can handle them, Captain. Anything else? I don't think so. I have a report on what took place at the Mallory House when Crook and Robinson attacked those two innocent real estate agents. Now is not the time, Higgum. I don't want to hear it. But they're threatening to bring suit, sir. He said he didn't want to hear it. All right, you two better get going. <laughs> It's almost time, Mickey. I'm gonna take off. Okay, fine. And as soon as I get the money, and I'm gonna clear, I'll call you. Don't worry, Frank. By the time you get back to pick me up, it'll be finished. Somebody reported your phone out of order. Where's your telephone? Nice place you got here. Make it fast. I'm expecting an important call. The trouble's in your main junction box. Where's your basement? Right this way. George, I'll get your box. One word out of you, and you're through. Ready? All set. Special Operator 41, police business. Urgent. Operator 41, Sergeant Robinson. Now, place number 555-4386 back in order. Right. Thanks. Phone will be working again in three minutes. Okay. I'll leave. You stay hooked onto the line. When Frank calls and we find out his getaway plans, we'll rescue the girl and go after him. Got it. You shouldn't have any trouble. If you do, just give us a call. Thanks. under control. I got the money, no problem. Great. I'm on my way to pick you up now. Take care of the girl right away. Don't worry, I'll handle it. Thank you. 
up without you. He went around the back, cover me. Yeah. Lenny. Lenny. Better go inside now and phone Mrs. Mallory. Mrs. Mallory? You can't phone Mrs. Mallory. I have to. She's probably worried half to death about me. Why should she be worried about you? I'm their maid. So that's uh, who Mallory's been running around with? Their maid? Well, I've heard of people going to a lot of trouble to hold on to their help. But this is ridiculous. I never really believed that national crime was broken up into families. But now I am a believer. It seemed that no matter where I would turn, I would bump into one of Duke Fletcher's relatives. This time it was Margot Delaney, the Duke's niece, and Landall Lewis, the Duke's cousin on his mother's side. To say the least, these two were very colorful characters, as you will soon see. And the city council once again defeated the mayor's request for a new convention center. Meanwhile, the murder trial of Roy Simon, underworld chieftain, moves into its fourth day. With the district attorney promising a quick conviction when he calls his key witness to the stand sometime tomorrow. For security purposes, the identity of this key witness has been kept a well-guarded secret. And now, Howard Betts and sports. <laughs> Oh, hi, George. Come on in. Hi, Lenny. What are you doing here on your day off? The captain asked me to come over here and give you this. Oh, what is it, a letter? Not quite. A subpoena? The Roy Simon trial. You're scheduled to testify for the prosecution tomorrow. No kidding. I was just hearing about it on the radio. So was I. You are the key witness that they were talking about. Me? You're the one that saw Roy Simon fire the shot that killed Dan Gerber. How come they asked you to serve the subpoena? Well, they figured since I was coming over here anyway. What do you mean, coming over here anyway? Today is our day off. It's supposed to be our day off, but the captain wants to see you in his office right away. Why, what's up? You'll find out when you get there. Well, you do you know what he wants to see me about? Yeah, I know, but I can't tell you. What do you mean, you can't tell me? It's the captain's orders. He wants to tell you himself. <laughs> Give me a hint. No, but I can give you the keys. You drive. You know, I think it's pretty lousy. Two guys who have known each other as long as we have, and one guy can't give the other guy a hint. Get in the car and start driving. We're late. George, that guy just tried to kill me. Is that enough of a hint for you, Lenny? Morning, Captain. Morning. Well, glad to see you got him here, George. How'd it go? Fine. Fine? Someone just tried to run me over less than an hour ago. You call that fine? Where did this happen? Right in front of my apartment. Well, that means the syndicate brought that man in earlier than we figured. We figured the hit for tonight. What hit? What man? What are you talking about? Uh, Lenny, we received a tip that the syndicate has given out a contract on your life. Why? To keep you from testifying at the Roy Simon trial tomorrow. You were the one who saw him holding the gun, weren't you? No, I saw him shooting the gun. I saw him holding the gun. You see, George was late. If George had been on time, we both would have seen him shooting the gun. I wasn't late. He got nervous and rushed in ahead of time as usual. The point is this. If George had been on time, 
He would have seen him shooting the gun. I would have seen him holding the gun instead of him just seeing him holding the gun and my seeing him shooting the gun. But as it was, George just saw him holding the gun and I saw him shooting the gun. Oh, I don't care. Then why did you ask? Evidently, you're not aware of the seriousness of this situation. The underworld has you marked for a hit. Well, I've been in danger before, Captain. I can take care of myself. Not this kind of danger, Lenny. They sent for the enforcer. The enforcer? Captain, if we know the enforcer's in town, why don't we put out an APB and have him picked up? Because nobody knows what he looks like. Nobody's ever seen him before. What do you mean nobody's ever seen him? He just tried to run me down less than an hour ago. Did you notice what kind of car he had? Well, I didn't notice what kind of car he had, but George did. All I got was a fast look. I don't even know what make it was. I know it was a black five-door. A car with five doors? Four of theirs and one of ours. I don't want to hear any more. Sergeant Crook, I'm relieving you from duty. From this moment on, you're officially under police protection. I've arranged for a place to hide you. Your meals will be brought in to you. You can't go out, talk to anyone, or see anyone. Sergeant Robinson is in charge. Robinson, you have your instructions. Get going. Right. Let's go, then. Good luck. And remember, don't take any chances. Wait a minute. Aren't you going to look outside? How do we know it's safe? This is a police station. The only people outside are cops. Well, supposing that the enforcer is disguised as a police officer. We've never seen him. We don't know what he looks like. Then it won't do me any good to look, will it? him with the car. Yes, we know. That little creep can move pretty fast. I'll nail him for sure next time. But not with the car. We just found out where they intend hiding him. National Hotel, room 304. The place will probably be crawling with cops. My best bet is to take him from the outside, make the hit through the window. There's no building across the street for a vantage point. That's why they picked that hotel. Then that's definitely the way to make the hit. They'll never expect it. I'll need some special equipment. Vince, go with him. Get him anything he needs. Landau. Don't miss this time. Consider him dead. <laughs> Went home to change and pick up our guns. It's okay. Come on in. Anybody see you bring him in? I don't think so. Are you sure? Take his word for it. Even I didn't see him bring me in. What a cheap dump. How come the captain picked a place like this to hide out in? The physical location of this place makes it tougher for them to get at you, and it makes it easier for us to watch over you. You guys got your assignments? Check. I've got the roof, Rosen here's got the desk in the lobby, and Harrington's checked in across the hall. Okay. Now get going, and remember, anything suspicious, call me. Right. I still don't understand why you pick such a cheap, crummy joint. Will you stop calling this place a joint? We just picked this place out because our men can give you the best kind of protection here. They know this place inside and out. How come? They raid it all the time. Lenny, you can relax. There's no way for the enforcer to get at you here. Oh, really? Really? Well, how about this? Supposing the enforcer decides to go down to the basement, to the ventilating system, take some poison gas, put it in the ventilating system in three minutes. Not a chance. We've got Roland and Perkins stationed in the basement. Oh. Uh, here. Well, let's kick this around for a while. The enforcer comes down the hall and knocks on the door. He wouldn't dare. We've got Margolin and Parker stationed at both ends of the hall. Do, do, do you mind if I finish? Huh? Do you? Do you mind? Hmm? Supposing the enforcer comes down the hall disguised as a bellboy. Now, I know that there are bellboys in this hotel because I saw one. That was Sergeant Goldberg. Sergeant Goldberg is working here incognito? Not incognito, Lenny. He moonlights here as a bellboy. Oh, you see? Well, you can relax. 
This place here is like a fortress. Well, maybe you're right, George. I suppose it would be pretty hard for the enforcer to get at me here, except maybe... Except maybe by the window! George, that's it! That's how he could get me! He could do it with a high-powered rifle. All he has to do is to get on the roof of the building across the street. Lenny, they tore down the building across the street three months ago. No building, no roof. No building, no roof. Probably Rosen with the food. It's the first good hand I had. Who's there? It's Rosen. I brought your lunch. See? Let's not take any chances. I'll cover you. Hey, Benny. Hi, George. Here are your hamburgers. Thank you. And your coffee? Sorry, Rosen. And your Danish? You got anything else for us? Even if I did, I wouldn't give it to you. the coffee or what, but it sure is getting warm in here. I open the window. Stuck. Yeah, let me try it. I'm very good with windows. It is stuck. Open up, George. It's all over. We got him. You got who? The enforcer. You're kidding. We were lucky. Never would have spotted him if the captain hadn't gotten that tip. One of our informers? Don't know. Anonymous caller. The captain got word to us just in time. A couple of more seconds and Lenny here would have taken it right through the window. I phoned the captain and filled him in, and he feels that since the enforcer's out of the way, there's no point in keeping Crook under protective custody. You can go home, Lenny. Well, that's great. Thanks, fellas. Appreciate it. Well, I'm glad I don't have to spend the night in this joint. Okay, let's go. I'll drive you home. <clears throat> you know something, George? I'm lucky to be alive. You know something, Lenny? That bothers me. It bothers you that I'm alive? No, it bothers me that the enforcer didn't find a better way to make his hit. Are you kidding? It was almost successful. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. The enforcer's never failed before. You know, kid, if you ever have to bump anybody off, get a woman to do the job. No one ever expects a hit man to be a woman. Where's Crook now? They dropped him off at his apartment an hour ago. He's all alone. Send in the enforcer. Your plan worked. The decoy is dead, and Crook is in his apartment alone. The hit must be made tonight.
sorry to bother you, but I'm your next door neighbor. And Very good. Hey, what are you, a welcome wagon? I'm busy. Uh, yes, well, I'm sorry to bother you, but uh, you see, I'm locked out of my apartment. Sorry, I'm not a locksmith. Hey, you, listen, fella, you see, we share the same terrace. If you'll just let me go through your living room, I can get to my apartment from your terrace. All right, but make it snappy, will you? Oh, how do you do? I'm sorry for the intrusion. Baby, you got plenty of time. Besides, there's a fog rolling in. You'll probably be grounded for a couple of hours. Yeah, there's one in the bedroom. Thank you. Andy, um, I really have to get going. How can you leave without finishing your drink? Is dead. No, George, the decoy is dead. The enforcer is waiting for me in my apartment. I'm calling from the apartment next door. Okay. Stay right where you are. I'm on my way. Thanks for the use of the phone. Appreciate it. Matter, won't you fit? I have to watch the hallway. I'm expecting my partner. Couldn't you watch the hallway better from the hallway? Psst, George! What are you doing out here? I told you to wait in your neighbor's apartment. He threw me out. George. I checked the halls, and she's still in there. She? Yes, the enforcer is a woman. No wonder nobody knows what he looks like. Well, how does she get in your apartment without you seeing her? Well, I don't know. She must have sneaked in when I took the garbage out. George, how are we going to handle this? I don't have a gun. Well, I'll have to take her through the front door, but if you can get through the terrace and get in there long enough to distract her. Well, that means I'll have to go through my neighbor's apartment. What's wrong with that? Nothing, except I may not live to get to the terrace. Look, it's the only way. It's 10.15 now. Exactly 10.20, I'm coming through that front door. You come through the terrace exactly two seconds before that to distract him. You got it? Got it. All right. Good luck. It's open! Uh, my friend just got here. Oh, well, that's nice. Mine's just leaving. 
Look, I have to use your terrace once more. This will be the last time, I promise you. I'm, I'm sure you know the way. Thank you. Would you please call me a cab? Uh, I'll drive you there myself. When? Right away. Excuse me a second. I'm gonna kill him. Uh, could I borrow your watch? Would you hurry it up, fella? Here, take a whole clock. What capture? I was on time. You were early as usual, and this time you almost got me shot. Well, what are you complaining about? She shot at me before she shot at you. Well, that's what you get for being early. Are you sure you don't need any help, George? I mean, I could just get into something and go downtown with you. And... I'll be fine. You just take it easy and get a little sleep. Remember, you got that trial tomorrow. Well, uh, good night, George. Right, good night, Lenny. not exactly a member of the Duke's family, but it was through him that I met Jennifer, the Duke's sister. I really didn't like Cremroy Harris as a person, but you might say that Jennifer turned me on. If the circumstances had been different, who knows, I might have ended up as the Duke's brother-in-law. <laughs> you were going to take it and have the shot fixed. Well, I was going to fix it this morning, but we have to pick your mother up at the airport. I'll do it right after that.
passengers should be coming in any minute now. Let's wait over here. here. I followed the professor and his girl to the airport. They're gonna meet somebody coming in on flight 114 from Miami. Miami, huh? And the diamond was stolen in Palm Beach. Ferguson, I'll give you better than even money that the man the professor is to meet is the suspect. Right. And whoever he is, he'll be coming through that door in a few minutes with the diamond. As soon as the professor tries to make contact with him, I'll move in. Be absolutely sure before you make your move. You know, that diamond's worth $750,000. We wouldn't want to scare them off. Don't you worry about that, Captain. I've been on this case too long to blow it now. Well, I'll say goodbye now, Mr. Krem. It was a pleasure meeting you, and I enjoyed your company on the plane. And I enjoyed yours, Mrs. Roberts. Oh, uh, here are your grapefruit. Oh, I almost forgot them. Thank you for carrying them. Well, goodbye, Mrs. Robinson. Goodbye, Mr. Grimm. take you up on that. Ah, there she is. <laughs> Hi, Mrs. Robinson. Hello, Lenny. Welcome home. Here, let, let, let me take these for you. Thank you. Yeah, well, shall we go? Ferguson. George, look who's here. It's Lieutenant Ferguson. Hi, Lieutenant Ferguson. Uh, Mom, this is Lieutenant Ferguson. How do you I'm do? Mom. How are you? What are you doing here? Uh, we came to pick up George's mom. Yeah, she's been in Miami for the last three weeks. And I had a marvelous time. And she had a marvelous time. Are you here to meet somebody, Lieutenant? Yes. Yes, I'm here to meet somebody I've been waiting to meet for eight months. Lieutenant Ferguson, you know what I think? What? I think you're waiting in the wrong terminal. No plane could be that late. But you can't blame us because there was a short in the siren. He's right, Captain. That was a mechanical failure, not a human failure. The short in the siren is a mechanical failure. But failing to get it fixed is a human failure. Biggest diamond robbery in all the years I've been with the department. This close to making an arrest. Huh? Would have been a promotion and a raise on salary for me. We're sorry about that, Captain. Well, the promotion and the raise in salary aren't really that important. A well, captain with your rank, a raise in salary and a promotion would have meant that you were transferred right out of this precinct. Well, that means that you wouldn't have been able to work with George and I anymore. That's what's important to me. Uh, captain, uh, why don't we put out an APB on the suspect and have him picked up before he can get rid of the diamond? Because we don't know what the suspect looks like. All we know that he was bringing the diamond in from Florida to have the professor cut it up so it would be easier to get rid of. Captain, it stands to reason that if the siren scared off the professor, then the suspect will have to make contact with him again. That's right. And Lieutenant Ferguson will be right behind him. And we'll be right behind Lieutenant Ferguson. 
What's that? Well, seeing as what happened at the airport was our fault, I think it's only fair that George and I give Lieutenant Ferguson a hand and wrap the case up right away. What do you think, George? Yes, yeah, the least we can do. Oh, no! I don't want either one of you anywhere near that case. Now, I realize what happened at the airport this morning wasn't really your fault. You just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. I'll buy that. Uh, you two happen to be victims of bad timing. Now, to show you that my heart's in the right place, uh, I'm going to tear up your report. Uh, Captain, could I have the pleasure of doing that? That wasn't your report. It wasn't? I bought a new car yesterday. That was my bank loan! I'm sorry about that, Captain. Get out. Uh, could we give you a lift? Get out! You feel like driving? I'm not driving that car till the siren's fixed, which is what we're gonna do right now. Hey, George, look, your mother left her grapefruit in the car. Uh, I'll give them to her when I get off duty tonight. I don't think that's such a good idea. I mean, I don't think you should leave grapefruit in the car on a hot day like this. They're liable to spoil. Okay, we'll take it to her now, which is, it's on the way to the garage anyway. Aren't you at the airport? I was at the airport. When I heard the police car pull up, I decided to get out of there and not take a chance of giving you away. Do you have the diamond? No, but I know where it is. What do you mean you know where it is? In a grapefruit? Oh, you'll fill me in when we meet. Where are you now? I'm across the street from the old lady's house. It's at the corner of uh, Weisskopf and Schiller. Now, all I have to do is get the grapefruit away from her. But she'll recognize you from the plane. Look, you better let us handle this. Don't do anything till we get there. All right, but make it fast. Lieutenant Ferguson certainly holds a grudge. Ferguson? Yes, he just drove by here and shook his fist at us. Honey, I'm beginning to get a terrible feeling. I think we did it again. They did it again? They did it again! Mrs. Robinson? Yes, I am Miss Gregg from the Department of Agriculture, and I understand that you brought some grapefruit back from Florida with you. Yes, I brought some grapefruit back. What about it? Oh, well, we have a report that a specific shipment of grapefruit may be contaminated with an unsafe amount of pesticides. And the grapefruit that you brought back are from that shipment. Oh, my goodness. Oh, no need to be alarmed. I can tell just by looking at them whether or not they're contaminated. But I don't have them. You don't have them? No, I didn't bring them back for myself. I brought them back for someone else. Uh, who? My son's boss. <laughs> and where can I get in touch with him? At the 33rd Precinct. He's chief of detectives. 
Now, if you'd like to come in and use my phone... Uh, no, no, that won't be necessary. I'll, uh, I'll go down there myself. If you had only gotten here an hour sooner, you could have stopped them. Stopped who? My son and his partner. They brought the grapefruit back to me, and I told them to take them down to headquarters and to give them to Captain Andrews. Twice in one day. Just when the professor was getting ready to make contact and Ferguson was getting ready to move in, you two arrive on the scene and ruin everything. All we were doing was dropping something off at my house. Now, how did we know that Ferguson was tailing the professor in that area, on that very street, at that moment? It's getting terrible, Captain. Every place we go in the city, Ferguson is there. Frankly, we don't know where to go anymore. That's Ferguson. He'll tell you where to go. George. What? I take back the grapefruit. Well, it's getting late. You two are going on duty. And I'm going home to spend a quiet, restful evening, the kind I usually spend when you're not on duty. Now, do me a favor, both of you, and stay away from Lieutenant Ferguson. You know, if the French Foreign Legion was still in existence, we would have lost Ferguson today. Captain, don't forget your grapefruit. And your briefcase. Oh, uh, thank you, George, and thank your mother for me. Yeah, I'd know that fist anywhere. If that was him, we'd be better off that he'd run us over. George! Oh. Look! Captain Andrews? Andrews, are you all right? What happened? I was mugged and I was robbed. Somebody held you up and took your wallet? Not my wallet, my grapefruit. Your grapefruit? Whoever the guy was, he must have been starved. No, kid, I'll give you another idea. If you ever have to hide anything, stick it in some fruit. I once hit a hot gun in a watermelon. Not your wallet. I don't know. All I know is he hit me over the head and I dropped the bag of grapefruit and he picked it up and ran. He didn't even look for my wallet. Something's happened to those grapefruit to make them far more valuable than just an ordinary bag of grapefruit. Of course. If your siren scared off the professor at the airport, it stands to reason it scared off the suspect as well. That's a possibility. It's more than a possibility, it's a probability. Yeah, that's what I say, it's a probability. If you had a hot diamond and the police were closing in on you, what would you do with it? I'd sell it. You wouldn't sell it, you'd hide it someplace, you'd get rid of it. No, I think first I'd sell it. You'd hide it someplace, you'd get rid of it. No, if you had it, you would hide it. If I had it, I would sell it. No, Lenny, I can't buy that. I'm not trying to sell it to you, George. George, you listen to me. Now, suppose you were the suspect, and you had a hot diamond, police are closing in on you, and you have to hide it. And the closest thing to you is a bag of grapefruit. What would you do with it? Sell it. <laughs> I'd hide it in one of the grapefruit. Exactly, and with an innocent-looking woman like your mother to carry it out of the terminal for you. It's a perfect place to hide it. That explains why he didn't take your wallet. He was after the grapefruit. Right. Get me Lieutenant Ferguson immediately. It also explains what Professor was doing at your house today. He was after your mother's grapefruit. What do you mean he doesn't answer? He has to be there. He's on stakeout duty. And he wouldn't leave without calling me first. Unless... 
something's wrong. I told you we were being followed. Inside, quick. I don't understand it. That's the last of the grapefruit, and there's still no diamond. Could it possibly have fallen out of the grapefruit while somebody was carrying the bag? No, I pushed the diamond all the way to the core, and I pressed it closed. It couldn't have fallen out. Jennifer, I think we could do with a drink. Well, I know I could. George, look, he left the microphone off the hook. It looks like he started to answer the captain's call and sudden stopped him. We better get up there fast. Right. What are you doing? The keys. In case they get away from us, they won't get far. Ah, nice work, Lenny. I'll go on up to the penthouse, sir. You phone headquarters for assistance and meet me up there. OK, but don't try to take them alone. Wait for me. Jennifer, let's get out of here. Not the elevator, the stairs. for the elevator before I could get off. Now, come on, Ferguson's up there bounding gag. Untie Ferguson, I'll check the bedroom. Uncuff me, the keys are in my pocket. They're gone, but they took the stairs. Come on, let's go. Gone. I always leave the key in the ignition so I won't forget it. Well, what are we going to do? Wait here. Police 
officers. All right, Professor, where's the other guy? Up there, George, you get him. I'll take care of these two. fell over the edge of the building. Well, I'll get it. It shouldn't take too long to recover. On second thought, I take that back. It may take longer than I thought. Why? Take a look. That's the biggest diamond I ever saw. And you boys will never see a more expensive one. I hope not. That one caused us enough grief. You men and Lieutenant Ferguson did an admirable job in handling this case. Thank you, sir. And Lieutenant Ferguson is up for a special commendation as soon as he gets well. He sure took it hard when he looked over the edge of that roof and saw where that grapefruit had landed. It took the both of us to keep him from jumping off the roof. But why did you let him cut open 6,000 grapefruit in that truck without any help? We tried to help him, but he threw a grapefruit at us. Then he held us at gunpoint while he proceeded to cut open every one of those 6,000 grapefruits. Then when he got down to the last grapefruit and found that the diamond wasn't in that one either, he really flipped out. But I don't understand. If he cut open every one of the grapefruit and didn't find the diamond, where did this come from? That was in the grapefruit he threw at us. Fletcher proved one thing to me over and over. Experience is the best teacher, and if you're fortunate enough to find a teacher who has had vast practical experience and who is willing to impart to you the wisdom of that experience, there is no limit to what you can learn and the heights you can reach if you are willing to accept this knowledge and put it to wise use. As time passed, I realized that a refresher course was in order, so I decided to do some graduate work. Naturally, I picked my old alma mater, Sunnybrook Penitentiary, a teacher, Duke Fletcher. We've got a roommate for you, Duke. Male or female? Hey, copper, don't forget to tell the chef I like my steaks rare. Clear. One step out of line, you get this. Oh, yeah? You try that, and you get this. Amazing fellow. I think we'll publish his story.